Hello, Internet. Welcome to episode 315 of the Assorted Calibers podcast, the second minute podcast. There's a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and with me tonight is the greatest hostess of all time. She's wonderful. She's amazing. She's amazingly patient. Erin Paulette. How you doing, Erin? I am in a fair amount of discomfort from things hurting, and it's nothing special. It's just I am old, and I exerted myself. A little too much. What was this strange exertion you did, Aaron? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was when I vacuumed my room, or maybe it was when I got the hedge trimmers and trimmed the the holly bushes in front of the house. It's it's all minor, but the older you get, the more you go. No, ow, can't do that now. Now I hurt. Uh, well, so, the great yay. joys of getting old is sleep injuries. I slept wrong, <laughs> and now I hurt. The one skill I thought I mastered. <laughs> <laughs> you did master it. You could just now figure out a way to f it up. <sighs> uh, so yeah, it, it's nothing dramatic, but it's just I, I am feeling every single one of my years right now. Uh, so how are you doing, weird? I'm doing. I'm doing better. I have. Uh, this is like my dad's superpower, which is that before I had, I had my daughter. Uh, I would like you know, wake up in the morning and have like a scratchy throat and be like, well, I was recording a podcast and we had a few drinks while we were doing it and all that. Maybe I just kind of, you know, irritated my throat and it'll, it'll clear up and, you know, it'll, it'll clear up eventually and all that. And then, you know, a day later or two later, uh, no, I'm sick and all that. Now I get the, my throat's a little bit scratchy and my daughter comes down with a cold and all that. And I'm like, well, yeah, I'm probably going to come down with something and nope, it just doesn't. I just feel cruddy for a while and then it goes away. And uh, it seems like today's the day where it's actually starting to go away. I'm actually, this is the first evening that I haven't felt like I was just getting over a cold in, in, like two weeks so hooray for, hooray for small miracles uh, yeah been uh i don't know <laughs> i don't know it was a it was it was a it was a dreary miserable weekend and uh and uh now it's uh now it's time to start to start start another week hello we are old <laughs> yes we we are old uh what one, one thing i will will say which will uh which will lead us into our our main topic is that my uh uh luckily i was able to convince my wife i wasn't I, I wasn't sure she is she is a second amendment supporter but she is not the diehard activist that i am and she had come home from a long day of work she had actually come home quite late and i was like hey would you mind you know, hopping back in your car real quick and we'll drive over to the gun club and sign the petition for the referendum question to repeal uh, the new, essentially the, the, the nice Serpa retaliation law here in Massachusetts. And luckily she said yes, which I, I really appreciated. And so we went down to the gun club and the guy manning the desk was, was also appreciative. And he was, he actually was from the same, same, same town as us. I didn't realize that. And, uh, yeah, so we both, uh, we both signed on the petition. It sounds like everything is going really, really well. Like he's, he's talked to the, the guy who said, you know, the, the, it's been today was that, that night was a slow night as far as petition signing, but as far as, uh, all the gun shops and local businesses and things like that, that have been, have been, uh, um, um, uh, air, airing the petition, they, uh, they've actually been doing pretty, uh, pretty good as far as, uh, signatures go. So hopefully we will have enough that'll get on the referendum. Uh, though, unfortunately I thought it might be this November, but it turns out it will be the, uh, for the, for the, for the midterm election, um, uh, midterm election. So it will be in two years, which kind of, oh, yeah, that, 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 that kind of sucks, but you know, it, it's, it's better than nothing and it will be, you know, 
it's and it's and it's better odds of it getting repealed that way than some you know the the what like 15 republicans that we have to, uh or some of the democrats that may be pro gun question mark uh float a uh, a repeal legislation mm-hmm. uh yeah and, you just have to live through the two years though that's the problem yeah uh but uh this is late breaking at the time of t- time of uh our recording this like dropped just a few hours ago but uh and and nobody was aware that this was happening but uh but the massachusetts legislators did a quick emergency session and essentially voted to suspend the new training requirements for um uh, the new training requirements uh, for licensing. Essentially, this new law. One of the things that it, I mean, it does a million things. It adds. Well, we we talked about it, yeah. however many episodes ago, and we were talking about this before the show. And you said one of the things that they required a gun owner to do was take a course on, like like run hide fight or you know what happens if if there there's a hostage situation a school shooter that sort of thing just something yeah. that's really way outside the likelihood of probability that's redundant but you know of 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 happening yeah and and the it changes right now uh, Massachusetts re- just requires that you take a training course. N- NRA uh, basic pistol is essentially the course named, but they say that or equivalent. And there's several independent uh, systems that uh, that aren't NRA related that uh, count as a Massachusetts uh, training course. But it could be anywhere, and, and it can be from anywhere. You can go up to Maine and get it done. You can, you know, go, go on vacation to Florida and take a training course down there and show the certificate. So long as it's within a certain thing, when you're applying for your Massachusetts permit and it's all well and good, the new law Mm -hmm. says, no, 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 it needs to be a Massachusetts training permit. So a permit that is issued by, or a, a certificate that's issued by the state and there is no issuing body. There is no curriculum. There is nothing right now. And the law is coming into effect, I believe, in a month. Um, and so and it's just one of those like and there's no money either being allocated mm-hmm. by this. So it's not like there's anything, any real, real, real forces being changed. So it's it's there's no sign of this, this training uh, training system showing up anytime soon. And. The word on the street is that Mara Healy realized that it will be a major political boondoggle if essentially Massachusetts does what Chicago did before uh, the McDonald case changed it, which was Chicago. You could still get, you know, concealed carry was not illegal in Chicago. You just needed a permit. But the only way to get the permit was you had to apply for the permit and the office that where you could apply for the ter- permit was permanently closed. And so there was nobody to actually issue you the paperwork for you to fill out and apply for the permit. And so therefore it was only people that were real, real tight with the chief of police that they could get somebody to make a special trip to actually go and get the paperwork and help them fill it out and do all that. But otherwise there was no one there to issue you a permit and there was, you, you couldn't actually apply for the permit. And so therefore there were no permits and that's essentially what we were fixing to do, but they did a, a stop gap, which, you know, on one hand, I mean, it's, this is good news uh, though. I got to wonder if, if having it be that bad might grease the skids for a, um, a an injunction pending a pen, pending a court case but i don't know it's massachusetts trying to trying to look on the bright side is generally ill-advised <laughs> that is remarkably cynical coming from you because you are the most optimistic muppet i have ever met yes but i've also lived in massachusetts for like 20 years <laughs> so. i'm just saying if you think it's too much dope for things are bad yeah, no, the, I mean, the, the best thing that has happened to us in Massachusetts as gun owners is that a law got passed a few years ago or a law got presented a few years ago, uh, is uh, close to like probably, probably like 12 years ago, honestly, at this point in time. And 
it was essentially designed to get rid of the uh, uh, the shall issue nature of our our um, our FID, the the essentially the hunting permit, the 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 hunting permit and or the you know eighteen to to twenty year old permit, uh, and that one was essentially if you pass your background check and you take your training class, you're going to get that permit. It's there's, there's, there's no, there's no, there's no way around it. Instead, they got it so that they were going to be able to deny, deny you for any reason, uh, just the same as the LTC permit. Uh, and instead the gun owners action league got a hold of that one. And it, that the, the permit did go to, to, to may issue like the original wanted, but, they also took pepper spray off. So now you can buy pepper spray over the counter uh, here in Massachusetts and don't need a permit to possess pepper spray. And uh, cause it was considered ammunition under the law. And, um, and also essentially uh, got, got rid of the, the uh, got rid of the letter system permit. So instead of having essentially, what was it? Four different uh, firearms permits from D being pepper spray, uh, C being the, um, C being the FID and then B and A were two subdivisions of the LTC. Um, instead it was just LTC and FID and that's it. And so it really just made things better. But again, this was an anti-gun bill that was, that was, that was perverted by the, the geniuses at the gun owners action league. So yeah, it's Massachusetts. The, the only thing that's going to save us is the Supreme court. Hmm. Or yeah. or, fe- or federal legislation, if if the you know if if if, if some if the Second Amendment people on on Capitol Hill decide to pass a bill that to essentially essentially a civil rights act for 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 the Second Amendment, uh, that sort of activity, uh, that would be that would be the uh, that would be another solution. So as bad as this is, I don't think it's as bad as the SKS that was used to, I can't even say tried to shoot Trump. I don't think this guy got a bullet off, and even if he did, there is no way he was hitting anything. Oh. We've got pictures of it in the show notes, and this is the most... So so last week, I, I, I defended TAPCO because I've got a Type 56... That, that I have tap code out and it, it performs well. It, it hits everything that I aim it at. And so this thing was, I don't know if I can really call it Bubba, because if you Bubba something, at least it works. This SKS was put in an ATI Monte Carlo stock, which, while not horrible, does not have good reviews. And then there's a scope that he taped and possibly also JB welded onto the receiver and then made an eye shade with, I'm not sure if this was a paper towel or a toilet paper uh, roll, you know, the, the cardboard core on the inside. Honestly, the more I'm looking at it, it almost looks like an orange juice concentrate tube. <laughs> I don't know what the heck it is, but y- yeah. <laughs> I, I I was I actually just before the show, Mister Guns and Gear was doing a uh, was doing a breakdown of of the rifle, and he was claiming, and I'm looking at the picture, he was claiming that it was one of their they they do make a top cover scope mount for the SKS, and he was claiming yeah, that, that it may they, have been they, the they t- sure do, but it doesn't look like this. No, it doesn't. That's the thing. I'm looking at it real, real close and I am not seeing any evidence of any actually scope mounts. Like it is literally like, I don't know if they're rubber bands or hose clamps or what those things are, but like there is no way that that scope is going to maintain zero, not only Mm -hmm. under shooting it, but also, just physical contact with the rifle mm-hmm. like if if you had this thing on a rack and you put, picked it up and pulled it off the rack it is going to shift the zero yeah. so it makes me wonder if this guy really knows how to use a gun because if if he knew how to zero a scope he wouldn't be shooting this so he clearly doesn't know how to zero it and i'm not even sure 
if it was his in the sense that he brought it with him. This seems like sort of a spur of the moment black market purchase, or I don't know, we may find out later that um, someone handed it to him, but this really feels like a useful idiot who knows very, very little about guns in general, who was just handed the rifle and told, put the crosshairs on Trump and pull the trigger. And he doesn't know anything about the the effective range of the 762 by 39 round, you know, about, you know, elevation hold, you know, anything like that. I, I feel like if this guy had emptied a full magazine at Trump, it wouldn't have gotten anywhere near him. I mean, it may have gotten near him just on sheer dumb luck, just because I think that scope is going to be just like a googly eye. It's just going to point whichever direction you shake it. And so in theory, there might get it be a, ch- be a chance that after one of the shots, it kind of slips out of that hose mount and kind of gets canted up in such a way that he's actually getting it to an appropriate ballistic lob and it goes through. But yeah, he had like a 30 round SKS mag, um, uh, affixed, affixed onto this thing. And, uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, the, the idea that like, even if he was given all 30 of the rounds with no incoming fire or any sort of thing. And Trump was a good boy and just stood perfectly still for him. The chances of him getting anywhere near Trump with this setup would seem, it would just be, it would be dumb luck. It would be dumb Mm -hmm. luck. Like it's, this is the, so the other shooter, the one that, the the one that, that, that took off the top of Trump's ear he was using a rifle with a non-magnified red dot. And I, I think I mentioned this last week is the fact that, yeah, the, the, the red dot was bigger than Trump's head. So essentially he was obscuring his target, just aiming at it, but at least it was an AR, you know, with, 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 with mm-hmm. a mounted optic, it was clearly zeroed because mm-hmm. he got close and, uh, I, I I mean I I hate to praise him, but if the dot obscured the target and he was still able to not only draw blood, but if Trump hadn't turned his head, would have scored a killing blow. I mean that that guy either he got just ridiculously lucky and and rolled the proverbial nat twenty, or is actually fairly skilled at shooting. Yeah. I mean, there, there certainly was talk that he that that he routinely practiced with this rifle, uh, and that though again, it's not set up for that kind of shooting. You know, you would you would think that he would have a magnified optic closer to whatever the hell this thing is attached to the SKS uh, on the <laughs> AR, and that would be a better setup. Not that I am at all suggesting people should have better setups when attempting to assassinate a president or former president. Um, again, you said, you said it great uh, last, last week on the, yeah, you think that, that, that it, it, it would be a good, if you think it's a good idea that, uh, that this person almost killed uh, this person tried to kill Trump. Like, yeah, no, if Trump dies, like things are going to get worse because he's going to be martyred and, and that is not going to do anybody any favors. Um, Mm. but, uh, but yeah, like both of these are like, I mean, I I wouldn't hunt a deer with this SKS, like even close range. I I mean, take the scope off and use the iron sights. You might be okay. Oh, absolutely. I I would absolutely hunt, 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 hunt deer with a, uh, with 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 an S, S, SKS with the with the factory irons, so long as I knew that it was going to be a fairly close shot. Like I said, SKS not known for 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 great accuracy. The sights aren't incredible as far as you know precision sights go. And then on top of all of that, the I did I did a quick search the uh the the other day because I was talking about the ammo and I went on both Lucky Gunner and Ammo to Go dot com and both of them the um the the most expensive seven point six two by thirty nine ammo available <laughs> was Winchester Super X uh soft points 
at like a dollar twenty three around, and uh, and those. I mean, that's not bad ammo. I'm not. I'm not throwing shade, but that's also not five precision marksmanship yeah, ammo either. Yeah, f- five hundred five hundred yards on a high value target sort of ammo. Mm-hmm. So that would be, but that that but that Winchester that Winchester Super X, yeah. Inside inside of a hundred yards on 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 a on a white tailed deer with an SKS with iron sights, yeah, no problem. That's actually mm-hmm. that's a perfectly reasonable thing. But this is this is not a a seri- a serious rifle for anything, and clearly not a, a, a I mean, obviously a serious person in the fact that like, no, I mean he's under arrest and he should be under arrest, and what he was doing was was a crime, and and an absolute menace and you know i i as i pre- as i predicted last time uh that i i suspect he's probably not going to to be found guilty i think he's probably going to be found non compass mentis unable to stand trial much like the uh, the aurora shooter or in the case of the porn world uh, ron jeremy and will just be remanded to a mental institution cuz like this is this is cuckoo bananas. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, moving on to, <laughs> ironically, I had uh, I uh, this this oddball actually uh, showed showed this to me, and uh, I actually well, I wasn't sure if I was going to run with it, and I said, you know what, I'm going to run with it because there's there's no news today. <laughs> we just covered two other stories that have that just broke in the last few hours, um, but uh, uh, but I I ended up. Uh, uh, watching this uh, this video from uh, Washington Gun Law um, about a, uh, a a case out of the which circuit is this um, third the third circuit uh, and this is over the um, the the court the court case challenging Delaware's assault weapons law and the interesting angle that i really wanted to cover obviously it's a case against an assault weapon and we were just talking about the massachusetts gun laws and all that like this is this is something that could save all of us uh in the uh in anti-gun states because pretty much most of the anti-gun states at this point in time have uh, and even some of the not so anti-gun states have put in gun and magazine bans so and i think it's pretty well supported by uh uh, by both the second amendment and the uh and the uh the 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 uh, uh the uh history history uh test um uh, put by uh uh by Clarence Thomas on uh, Nicerpa that yeah no this is not a this is not a constitutional law but the interesting statement is it's a uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a petition for uh writ of uh uh, a certiori, certiori. I don't know how to pronounce that. Do you know how to pronounce that, Aaron? You know, I did, and then you said what you said, and it kind of overrode it. And now I'm overthinking how to say it. Yeah, I, so... I kind of saw it as yeah, certiori. I think I've heard people say, but yeah. Now that if, if that's not accurate, that's a hell of a lot closer. So we'll yeah. go with that. Yes, but. Uh, um but the, the essentially premise is that they are they're calling for an emergency injunction against this law being enforced on the grounds that um, that the court has precedents uh, uh, precedents that all of these uh, all cases against other enumerated constitutional rights have been considered. Um, I'm trying to see, remember the the word. That... Okay, you you are butchering this. Okay. Um, the way that this was phrased by uh, William Kirk of Washington Gun Law mm-hmm. is that he compared it to a First Amendment case. I don't remember which, and it has been determined by that particular circuit that any time someone's First Amendment rights are infringed upon. It is irreparable harm, and so once you prove that that this is you know infringes upon your right, it's it's irreparable harm, and that law needs to go. But when you try and apply this to the Second Amendment, they say no, that's not true. 
And the very thin argument they're making is that, well, when, when we infringe your right to speech, we're not letting you speak. But when we infringe against your right to keep and bear arms, as long as we aren't completely removing your right to keep and bear arms, we're only restricting it, then it's okay. You know, in other words, um, as long as we allow you to have a revolver, you still have an option to keep and bear an arm so we can restrict all of the semi-autos, and that's perfectly legal. That is really what the case is. You're allowed to have a single shot 410. Congratulations. You're armed. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, this... And essentially, the, the whole premise behind the whole William Kirk's position, and, and it's actually directly written out in this case, and it's been stated by Clarence Thomas on multiple occasions that the Second Amendment is being viewed as a second-class right in the fact that in light of a Fourth Amendment case or a First Amendment case or a Fifth Amendment case or even a Fourteenth Amendment case, as mm-hmm. a general rule, the court has been very, very forgiving and very, very liberal at the interpretation of of these, um, you know, the, the, these these harms uh, being done to, to to people, these violations of rights. Uh, but not when it comes to the the, the Second Amendment. Instead, yeah, it, we have instances where you know minor infractions will remove your right to uh, your your right to keep and bear arms for the rest of your life. You know, say you know you're pinched with a, you know a minor a minor felony, a, a domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera. Like that's gone. But meanwhile, there's not any sort of situation where you lose your Fourth Amendment rights or your First Amendment rights or things like that. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a uh, um, uh, it is it's it really is when you think about it that way, it is absolutely a uh, um, being treated as a second class right. It's a right, but yeah, not really. Well, I mean, the court literally stated petitioners fail to establish an irreparable harm other than the loss of their Second Amendment rights. <laughs> I mean, gee, if the court acknowledges that you're losing a constitutional right, seems to me that's an indication of irreparable harm because yeah. losing any of your rights is irreparable harm. But um, that particular circuit doesn't see it that way. And hopefully this will appear before SCOTUS. Yes. I mean, it's, again, the the number of assault weapon ban cases that are floating around is, uh, it, it certainly does seem that. And again, I don't know the rules for how SCOTUS chooses cases, but God, I mean, this is, this is covering a lot of people. So for SCOTUS to, to not, to not take this and hopefully take it soon. I mean, just put it out of its misery. I mean, it's it's you don't get much more cut and dry than that, and yet the courts keep going. Yeah, we'll like stand on one foot and pretend like it's something different. So, yeah, this is this is nuts. But uh, and I actually wanted to uh, to use this as a tie-in. This was this has been floating around, and I was kind of like, eh, it's not really. It's a it's it's an older video. And it's it's an older video, sir, but it checks out. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well played, Aaron. Well played. Um, but it, you know, it, it just it it seemed like it seemed a little a little too partisan politics to be used in in the assorted calibers podcast, even though it is a uh, even though it is very much a Second Amendment thing. But one thing some people have talked about is that oh you wouldn't see this level of infringement on somebody's first amendment rights or on somebody's fourth amendment rights or that sort of stuff and of course we have even though it's debatably first amendment with things like youtube's crack uh, crackdown and censorship on uh firearms content uh and uh and, and things like that uh you know there's it could be argued that it's first amendment because of the sheer monopoly that YouTube and Facebook have on, um, on, uh, on, on those, on those, uh, mediums, but, uh, they are still private companies. It's not direct government action, but we have 
this video from when Kamala Harris was, I believe, the attorney general of San Francisco when mm-hmm. Gavin Newsom was the mayor of San Francisco at the time uh, saying, uh, well, I'll I'll just play it right here. Um, it's people who own guns who are quietly sitting on those guns and those guns might end up being the weapons of, of the destruction of a community because they get in in the hands of some kid who decides that they like what they see on television and they want to act that way. So um, this is about just basically saying that we're going to res- require responsible behaviors uh, among everybody in the community. And just because you legally possess a gun in the sanctity of your locked home doesn't mean that we're not going to walk into that home and check to see if you're being responsible and safe in the way you conduct your affair. Fourth Amendment says what? Yeah, exactly. Is So and the reason why I wanted to get into this, I mean, obviously, I'm not a huge fan of Kamala Harris as far as Second Amendment person, like not even getting into the partisan angle of it. But on the uh, the Assorted Calibers podcast is a nonpartisan podcast, and we are we we uh, we're open to all political viewpoints and things like that, with the exception of people that want to restrict the right to keep and bear arms. And unfortunately for Kamala Harris, she one of those people who just can't help but constantly say how much she wants to restrict the right to keep and bear arms. But I've also noted that uh, I've, I, I've, especially back in my blogging days when I was blogging all the time, I pointed out the fact that they aren't anti second amendment activists. They're anti freedom activists because these are the people that are trying to say that you can't talk about being a gun owner you know, the, you hear people talking about how, oh, um, you know, the, the, you know, being, uh, well, we'll actually, we'll hear, we'll hear David talking a little bit about like, you know, being, you know, being afraid to talk about, um, uh, be, you know, be, being, being into guns with all that. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter's uh, wanted to go to the, uh, wants to go to the shooting range. And just one of those like, yeah, you can go to the shooting range, but eh, keep it quiet when you go to school. <laughs> the next day, what what'd you do this weekend? Oh, I hung out with my dad. You know, don't don't go don't don't, don't go talking about the sh- the shooting range because schools can get weird about that sort of stuff, even though it's perfectly legal and perfectly fine. And furthermore, these are also the type of people that are going to want to say, oh, you need a license and all your guns need to be registered. And just to make sure that you're complying with the registration, we want to come in and inspect your guns. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, not only do you not have a second amendment, right? Because you need a permission slip just to own guns, but also to have that permission slip, you're also waiving your, uh, you're also waiving your, your, your fourth amendment rights. And, uh, you know, who knows what other stuff, uh, actually, interestingly enough, that there was there was a court case that said that uh, uh, that criminals actually weren't required to register, could couldn't be charged with uh, with with failure to register their firearms because it would incriminate themselves. Correct. It's a Fifth Amendment violation if you are mm-hmm. a convicted felon and you've got a gun, especially a stolen gun. You can't register it because you would be telling on yourself, and that is protected on on, on the Constitution. So, therefore, they're actually not required to, uh, to to register guns, which, of course, is also hilarious in and itself. Because oh, registered guns, it's supposed to protect against crime. Yeah, not not as much. Nope, it's only only works for the law abiding people. Hmm. <laughs> well, well, uh, that that was supposed to represent sort of long-suffering OGs, but I realized that could be interpreted different ways. That's exactly how, how, how I heard it. Is, yeah. Good, good. That, that, that was supposed to be an audio version of me just face-palming. Yeah, no, these, the, the, these, these fanatical anti-freedom people just know no limits to how much they want to trample on not just one, but all of your rights. And... To tie into the trampling of rights, uh, back in episode uh, 313, Oddball had his analysis of uh, Massachusetts weapon laws. And uh, host emeritus of the gun blog variety cast, John Sarantino, was listening along. And he found that he thought that he found a error in Oddball's analysis. (laughs) 
I was listening to Oddball's segment last week on automatic knives with some interest because as much as I like my Spyderco Endura Wave, I'd really like to carry something more interesting and possibly purple. At the end of his segment, Oddball got rather heated about how Massachusetts bans slingshots. I thought this was unlikely, so I clicked the link and read the law. Turns out that Massachusetts, like several other states, doesn't ban slingshots. They ban slung shot. Totally different thing. Don't feel bad, Oddball. Until I started working with Grassroots North Carolina, the gun rights organization in my state, I had never even heard of slung shot. It's a common and very accurate belief that legislators are morons who ban things that don't exist, misspell the names of things they wish to ban, and use definitions for things that no one with even a slight familiarity with these items would ever use. So it's natural to see slung shot and assume they meant slingshot, but were just too stupid to spell it correctly. So what is slung shot and why is it illegal in several states? Wikipedia defines it this way. A slung shot is a maritime tool consisting of a weight or shot affixed to the end of a long cord, often by being wound into the center of a knot called a monkey's fist. It is used to cast line from one location to another, often a mooring line. The cord end is tied to the heavier line, and the weighted end of the slung shot is thrown across the intervening space where a person picks it up and pulls the line across. Weird should be familiar with them from his time as a fisheries observer. Sailors will tie a weight to the end of their mooring line so they can throw the lines to the people on the pier. There used to be a special knot called a monkey's fist tied around the weight. The days of wooden ships and iron men is now over. So, for safety reasons, it's recommended that you use sand-filled bags now. Sailors quickly realized that a lead weight wrapped in hemp line made an excellent tool for informal percussive negotiation. Think of it as reverse phrenology, where instead of studying the shape of a person's head for clues as to why they behave in the way they do, you apply lumps to their head until they act in a manner you find more pleasing. Naturally, those that we employ to keep the peace found the idea of sailors holding informal percussive negotiation sessions in their town to be less than optimal. Their solution was to ban the possession of slung shot. Massachusetts bans the carry of slung shot, while my home state of North Carolina only bans carrying them concealed. While finding some useful links for this segment, I learned that one of Abraham Lincoln's most notable trials was a murder defense, where the suspect, Duff Armstrong, was alleged to have murdered another person with a slung shot. Honest Abe used an almanac to show that the moon wasn't bright enough for a witness 150 feet away to have seen Duff strike the victim that night. As I said in the beginning, don't feel bad if you read the various state laws and assume that politicians were stupid and couldn't spell. That happens so often that it's usually a good starting point in any discussion about the law. But in this case, they used the correct term for a weapon that's now so rare that few of us even know of it. If you'd like to learn to tie the monkey's fist, I've included some links to videos of both how to tie them, but also links to a very nice jig to allow you to tie them more easily. I think I'll be spending 75 bucks, including shipping, for the jig, three colors of paracord, and getting to work. Oddball, what do you recommend for a switchblade that's purple and less than $200? I like straight point and drop point blades, but I'd be open to other styles if there's a good justification. I'm anticipating that the Massachusetts of the South will eventually come around to legalizing switchblades now that the Massachusetts of the North has led the way. All right, so uh, first up, Sean, there's a reason why we have the show notes. Oddball linked both the Mass General Law Section 10 that's cited in your show notes. Uh, again, Sean supplied some uh, some uh, some wonderful links. Go 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 check those out. Uh, but also Section 12 that bans the manufacture and sale of a number of uh, of of weapons, including both slung shot and slingshots. So. Yeah, no, they're they're both illegal. Not not one or or the other, and it's not a misconception. No, no, no. Slingshots and slung shots are illegal in Massachusetts, which should be again ridiculous for either way. And uh, John's also right in the fact that yeah, no, when uh, when we used to actually, I never I never saw a, a monkey fist being thrown onto the dock, um, but I did. I, mostly because the boats that I was on were actually much smaller than the boats that need need that sort of uh, docking thing. We, we, were, we were small enough that someone could throw a line to just somebody standing on the docks. Uh, but uh, 
I, I frequently would go out on pair trawlers, which is essentially uh, a trawl net, but instead of between otter boards or, or doors, however you want to say it, being used to spread the net, it was actually two boats being used to spread the net. And they absolutely would throw, get the boats as close as they could safely, and then throw a monkey's fist across with a thin line, and the thin line was tried to a thicker line, and they'd use that to tie off the trawl line onto, between the two boats. So yeah, mon- monkey's fists are still being used very, very regularly on boats, and they were, and they were not sandbags; they were legit monkey's fists. And uh, I guess the last point that I wanted to make is actually Sean did educate me on one thing, which is I don't think I ever really look looked up the definition for slung shot. I actually, I think when I was first reading over these lists, when I first got to Massachusetts, it was just pouring over the sheer idiocy of the weapons laws that we have here. And I saw that there was both sling shot and slung shot on there and so they're two different things so they must be two different things i assumed that one was a slingshot of which it is uh as you know but slung shot i always assumed was actually like the david goliath type type of sling and shot rather than again a monkey's fist so yeah i don't now the question is can 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 can, can i get a uh can i use a uh, a hunting sling <laughs> In the, st- in the state of Massachusetts. I don't know. <laughs> I don't actually don't know how to, how, how to use one. I, I, I would worry. I'd, I, I would literally shoot my eye out. David continues his GOA goals interviews by sitting down with Anthony Battaglia, the president of Accurate Mag, to take a walk down memory lane. Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. Continuing my series on the Gun Owners of America Goals Expo, and specifically Media Day, in this segment I talked with Anthony Battaglia of Accurate Mag. What caught my attention with his booth was the display of AR retro rifles and upper assemblies. Regular listeners of the podcast know I'm a sucker for retro ARs. So let me allow Anthony to introduce himself. We are here at the, uh, the GOA Goals event with Anthony Battaglia of Accurate Mag. So our, our real family business is BML Tool and Manufacturing Corporation. We've been a uh, tool and die shop um, since 1965. Started in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And uh, really nothing firearm related in Connecticut to speak of. A, oh yeah, it's sarcastic <laughs> there, yeah. Uh, you know, we have Gun Valley, right? And you know, I, I always get people from economic boards, they ask me, you know, oh, why don't you move to like Wyoming or Bob or Texas? And I'm like, because you don't have 30 different coding houses down the road that I can get something done in two days. Like our infrastructure, our aerospace. So Connecticut's GDP is still 12 to 13, 14% manufacturing wise. But yeah, a lot of firearms company have left, but those vendors like us still exist. Right. Yeah, I, I lived in the Albany, New York area and was out by, at Remington several times. Ilion, that's no more. Yeah. Sadly, no. But, yeah, so that was the other end of Gun Valley, basically. Yes. Yes. One of the co-hosts of the podcast lives in Massachusetts, and yeah. Smith & Wesson is now here. Yeah, their corporate's still up in Westfield. Savage is in Westfield, though. You yeah. know, they keep on getting bought out and sold, and mm-hmm. they don't, you know, it's this, it's, it's you know, the, it's the it's, trends and shifts that right. define and us. Right, just national and international corporate yeah shifting so it, but it's anyway fun. yeah back I to mean, you thank you <laughs> yes so where to start uh well where did you start quickly my grandfather after the korean war started at bridgeport tool and die which can trace their roots back to 1922 the jones brothers started it and uh you know wheels on the on the, the ceiling that that you know are all belt driven machines and back yep. in the day and he worked there in the early 50s, 53, I think. And then him and two his partners, uh, they said, screw it. Uh, they started their own shop. And later on in life, I learned that they were actually backed by Bridgeport to a little bit. They were all kind of friends. And, you know, these like American, Eastern European or European countries, that kind of thing. And it's interesting because a lot of really high-end vendors... They're all, they're all these families that we all, I know, we went to high school with each other and this right. and that. Um, it's, it's a, in many ways, it's a very small community. Yes, yes. 
And so quickly, they started in Bridgeport off uh, in Black Rock in about 1965. I still have a couple of the old photos from back in the day when my father was eight or so. They just slowly built up, right? They moved to Fairfield, Connecticut, the Gold Coast, which is, you know, stupid real estate now. But back in the day, it was, you know, a lot of industry. They built on in 1996 or four for their press area. And then in 2006, we started doing CNC. We started buying Herco machinery. Oh, sorry, you started buying what machinery? Uh, Herco's, Herco machines. Um, vertical machine centers. We started making um, more machine parts for Colt. And in 2009, 2010, we ended up in where we are in Monroe, Connecticut, where we still are to this day, and we just built another building. So nice. that's kind of our quick history. Right. Um, as far as our firearms legacy goes, Ruger is in Southport, Connecticut. Right. My grandfather's shop was five minutes down the road. So we, we were always doing stuff with Bill Ruger and a couple of those people, Superior Platings right across the street. So they all were in the same purview each other. Um, right. We were a huge shop for Winchester back in the day before they closed down for the Olin Corporation in 2003. In fact, a lot of our benches in our new shop are from the old uh, Winchester factory. Y you mentioned when we were chatting briefly yesterday some of the stuff that you found in those old yeah, benches. Yeah, yeah, we found we found shotgun parts. We have I have a bazillion files. I mean, the amount of files I have are brushes. You can't have too many files. No, no, no. Especially when you you look at one and it's all worn out, you just throw it on another table, and then some other guy uses it, and then. He throws it on another table, and it's a cyclical doom, you know? Yep. And then eventually someone takes it to a blacksmith who makes it into a knife. Yeah, yeah, some, you know, boutique, you know, guy or whatever. Right. But anyways, so yeah, uh, our real interesting with our, our hand guards, and uh, I'll come get one. So there's an electronics company called Hubble Electronics, and this is the year's like, let's say 1986. Okay, 1986 is around and uh, the M16A2 is coming about, and the double heat shield handguards around. Well, they couldn't make it. And we're, we're a big man electronics manufacturer for Hubble. And I don't want to say huge, like we're, you know, we're a decent size. And they're like, we can't do this. We end up figuring out how to do it. And the year's like 1990, 1991. And we started making uh, the handguards for Colt, like 1989, 90, somewhere around there. Right. So, that's been a lot of our legacy. Right, I see you also got the triangle handguards. The triangle handguards are something um, we did for a customer. Um, I have a couple of them here, but it's just a good to show. Right. But, you know, the rib double heat shield handguard, the long one, and low, low dome, we've been doing it forever. And if you just, you know, feel, yeah. you know, that's it's a solid. fiberglass composite layup, not yeah. injection molded, yeah. Yeah, it's not 3D printed, it's not flexible. Right. So, you know, bring up to late '90s. We're we're selling, we're making, we're stamping parts, receiver end plates, automatic sears, caps, uh, um, auto sears. Yeah, I'm making like fifty thousand right now. I got some. And like, we can't own any of them. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Not your fault. It's the sorry. NFA. NFA needs to go away. Yeah, they are fun to own. Yeah. So just quickly, you know, early 2000s G Watt, right? We, we built a lot of random stuff for Colt. We've been a lot of good, cool projects. Um, there's a book called Black Rifle 2, Chris Bartucci made. I have uh, both both yep. Black Rifle and Chris, Black Rifle Chris, 2. Is a, Chris is a dear friend of mine. and um, Those are my go-to yes. reference books. Yes. Uh, and I bought them early on. So I got them for normal prices. Yep. And now if you try to find a copy of either one of those... Yeah. So I, I have signed I have signed copies from Chris's boss, but you know nice. I got to grow up with with General Keys and General Battaglini, um, who ran call for a number of years, and I remember as a kid going in there and seeing what it was like shooting automatic rifles, and I grew up with it. And of course, you can't tell your friends because they're like you're insane, you know. Uh, I, I I grew up in New York. I understand. Yes. So um, yeah, just. So that's kind of our like basic history on that. We did a lot for Winchester and Mossberg right. and in and out like anyways. Anthony and I talked quite a bit more that day, so stay tuned for additional segments from our discussion. I got up at 5:30, I made a model and then I had my brother 3D print it and then I went into the tool room, maybe in the spring and then put it all together. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, 
please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast Facebook or MeWe pages, and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. Finally, I'm a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the names Brennabach and David Bach. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. Oh man, this is a, a great little reminder about how that was not that long ago when New England was all factories instead of just suburbs of the megalopolis. I mean, people always say, you know, oh man, why are all these like major gun companies in like anti-gun states? You, know, you got like, you know, Henry Rifles is in is in New York. You've, Smith & Wesson still is based in Massachusetts, but they're going to be gone. I mean, there's a ton of Massachusetts-based gun companies, ton of New York-based ones, ton of Connecticut ones and all that. But it's one of those like, well, it wasn't that long ago when these states weren't anti-gun and then and it was the point where this is the where all the factories were before the factories all closed down. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, Aaron and I were just talking about the fact that we're we're, we're looking forward to hearing about the products that uh, uh, that uh, that Anthony makes. Uh, so yeah, all all, all I've, I've scrolled through the info and so that he's got the 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 accurate mag and yeah. Don't know anything about it because we haven't got there yet. We have to wait till next week. Uh, but I, he does have the uh, the retro arms in the show notes, and uh, man, there uh, those do look really really cool on the the various old school style AR uppers. Of course, Aaron, you mentioned be- being old and just being old is one of those like, <laughs> wait a second, I thought triangular handguards and carry handles is what we were getting away from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but now, but now, but now they're retro and cool. Well, you know, you wait around long enough, everything old becomes fashionable again, usually by high school kids who don't fully understand what they're endorsing. There is, it's it's not huge money, so it's not as ridiculous a story as it can, but there is a collector's market for the Pontiac Aztec just because it's strange and weird and they didn't and because it was such a, a flop they didn't make that many of them so it's kind of rare and bespoke so yeah there's uh that that, that is how that happens eh, i'm trying to remember who made that one okay my favorite retro looking car which i feel like didn't get enough uh airtime was the plymouth prowler Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it it had this very 1920s, 1930s aesthetic, yet modernized, which I liked, but I think a lot of people didn't. The big issue was that it was just a two seat open fender roadster, but it was not very powerful. So it was a. It looked faster than it was, it, right? It look it it looked very very fast, but compared to even say just a basic corvette it was remarkably slow uh i mean some 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 people did uh, did did turbocharge them and get them so that they got actually fairly quick but they were they 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 were supercar impractical but they were just kind of regular car fast so people mm. just were going to be like if i'm going to be just getting regular car fast, but they were flashy. I mean, every time, every time I'd ever see one, they would, they, they would, uh, they would absolutely like people would pass them by and just be like, Oh my goodness. That's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. I will say the one I actually just watched uh vice grip garage. He bought an old one. And uh, for those who haven't watched vice grip garage, one of the things he does that I love watching is he buys cheap barn, fine cars and gets them running again and often drives them home. And, uh, the, uh, the car that he just ended up getting, he went up to Canada and got himself a, uh, Di Tommaso Pantera. And uh, I got to say, I have, as far as classic cars go, I have a real soft spot for the Di Tommaso's. They are really, really striking cars. I do not know what those are. Yeah. They didn't get a ton of stuff because they were essentially, it was a partnership with Ford it didn't sell all that well, and I think there was there were there were some major like design issues with them, so that they didn't actually run 
all that great. Um, oh, there's a nice looking one. That blue one is really sharp. That's the that's the Pantera, and then the predecessor to the to to the Pantera. I actually think is even sexier is the Mangusta, which oh, there's a there's a whole nice series of them on the front end the back end <laughs> that, that that red one really reminds me of a of a mustang but with like an overbite yeah yeah it's actually it, it does it does have a, it does have very much a uh a mach one uh mach one mustang uh look to it which is another really great classic car line though that that's it's it's mid-engine though it did have essentially a mustang engine and they were all powered by fords so it's Ford, Ford, Ford powertrains, but mid engine, mid engine, I will say exotic. I don't know if they quite were supercar level, though actually they're pretty light. So my, my mechanic actually had a, uh, a Pantera and, uh, yeah, he, he was mentioning how, how, how terrifying it was to drive the thing just cause it had so much power and it's a seventies car. So it was like super duper sketchy, <laughs> but you know, who's not sketchy, Aaron, our listeners our listeners thank you so much uh for for listening to this show we're gonna thank you each and every one of you but also very special thanks to all our supporters on patreon to be a patreon patron go to patreon.com slash assorted calibers podcast to sign up you can also go to the show notes and find the link use the show notes uh patrons get an early piece of the podcast plus bonus content like hilarious blooper reels the acp film tracks and the acp mag dump also, please remember to rate us on both Apple Podcasts and Pocket Casts. Subscribe to us on the platform of your choice and share the show with your friends, both online and off. I've got a blog. It's weirdworld.com. That's W-E-E-R-D world.com. And hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. And, uh, you know, the algorithm seems to be suppressing me and shadow banning me. So I, I don't know if there's any point. But if there ever is any point to all this, you can find me at linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linktree.e forward slash Aaron Paulette, all one word. I mean, the, the way to get past the shadow ban is to have people go through an, al- on, through an alternate location. So, yeah, go, 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 go check Aaron Paulette out. Go, go, go to the link tree. And thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. Weird is an Italian roadster with an overbite. I am an American roadster that looks retro but has mediocre acceleration. Our, I realize this is falling apart, but I really don't really know how better to do it. So, you know, our, I don't know, our car avatars, whatever. It, it's all assorted, and so is our podcast. And so is the quality of this joke. Good night, everyone. Good night.